Good evening. Uh, good evening, and, and welcome to the Aspen Institute. Uh, I'm Dana Joya, uh, the director of the Harmon Eisner Program in the Arts, and welcome to this uh, special uh, event. Uh, you know, in the Alma and Joseph Gildenhorn series, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, which is a real pleasure because uh, we have somebody this evening who uh, I think is one of the most interesting people writing about uh, literature right now, uh, James Shapiro. I'm going to give you just a little bit of, of, of the factual background on him, but then I want to just say one or two th things about him. Uh, uh, James Shapiro has a BA from Columbia and did his graduate work at the University of Chicago. Uh, he uh, is quite well known uh, for editing two uh, very influential uh, sort of compendium. One's an, an anthology, the Columbia History Anthology of British Poetry, and the other is the Columbia History of British Poetry. Uh, meanwhile, he's done four uh, significant books in, on Shakespeare and Elizabethan drama. The first one, Rival Playwrights, Marlowe, Johnson, and Shakespeare, and then uh, a book called Shakespeare and the Jews, uh, which e examines Shakespeare's uh, age uh, as an age of, of more diversity, shall we say, than uh, was often uh, thought of in the 19th century. And then he did a, a, really, a really interesting book called A Year uh, in the Life of William Shakespeare. In case you're wondering what year it is, it's 1599, uh, you know, right, be, right before uh, he writes, or we suppose he writes, Hamlet. Uh, and then we're, uh, the book uh, that we're talking about tonight, tonight is called Contested Will, Who Wrote Shakespeare? Now, I want to uh, go back to about 60 years. About 60 years ago, the famed British poet W.H. Auden uh, decided to give a series of lectures on Shakespeare's plays for the New School in Manhattan. And there was an enormous response. People kept phoning, and they wanted tickets, and they were sold out. And finally, one of the secretaries got so angry, she turned to the other and said, you'd think it was William Shakespeare speaking on W.H. Auden. Uh, <laughs> in a, uh, and uh, in England, at least, uh, you know, the reception of, of James Shapiro's book is pretty much as if William Shakespeare had written a book on James uh, <laughs> Shapiro. Uh, uh, this book has received uh, some of the most interesting and intelligent uh, and broad uh, coverage, I think, of, of really any historical uh, study of, of on English literature in recent years. Uh, we have the cover article of the current issue of TLS. You know, uh, you know, this is you know, uh, Jim is the cover boy. You know, although you know, uh, uh, in terms of that of the book, and the book uh, is a remarkable book from a couple of ways. First, because of the stated subject, what what the subject of the book is about. But the, the other thing is, if you read this book, uh, uh, Professor Shapiro, in the course of this, begins to talk about a lot of the ways in which we read and think about and respond to literature, both the average reader and academics. And as a professional writer and, and, and anthologist and critic, uh, reading the book, Besides this, the, the really interesting historical uh, and intellectual argument that Shapiro makes, the insights that he brings about how we think about literature, how we think about the, the act of creation, uh, I found really pretty remarkable. So uh, this is, I think, without a question, uh, you know, one of the one of the best books that I've read, you know, in in the, in the last couple of years. Well, certainly one of the best nonfiction books that I've read in the last couple of years. And it was funny, as I was preparing this, I got a, a, an email from the, the, the playwright David Ives. Many of you might have, might have met him at, at Aspen last summer. He's, got, he's the translator of The Liar, currently running it uh, by Cornet. And he says, I'm just reading a great new book. You got to read it. Uh, it's called Contested Will. <laughs> and I, I sent him an, an invitation, but alas, he's not here. Uh, so now I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but I think it's the logical place to, uh, to begin. You're pretty sure Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. Would, uh, would you summarize the evidence? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And, and the truth is, if three pages into the book, I confess as much. I, I say that I've been teaching Shakespeare for 
the past 25 years at Columbia and a few schools before that. And uh, if you study the life and the work and the culture as, uh, as deeply as, as someone like me, you won't have any doubts about this. And I save till the very end of the book the evidence for Shakespeare. The, the truth is I'm not very interested in what people think, which is a terrible thing to admit, but <laughs> I'll admit it because those of you who are engaged in arguments with anyone, whether those are arguments about abortion or creationism or whether the Holocaust existed or a hundred other arguments, you learn pretty quickly what positions are, and positions are fixed. And in no discussion of any issue that I've ever encountered are positions more fixed and minds less easily changed than the authorship question. So, and, and if I were to have written a book about what people think, what the positions are, it would have been a, a book you could have written on a, on a postcard. So what I began to get interested in is, why do smart people think dumb things? And everybody, <laughs> anybody who has ever been in a committee meeting or, God forbid, a departmental meeting knows that on occasion, even the very smartest people have said dumb things. And I not only got interested in what those smart people were saying, but why they were saying it. Because unlike questions like Holocaust denial or creationism or even abortion and other contested issues, um, it's very hard with those issues to, to track historically when ideas developed to the point where a theory emerged. But with this particular case, I was able to say with great confidence, no one was able to think that somebody other than Shakespeare wrote the plays until the 1840s, yeah. you know, 200 years after Shakespeare lived. And it was quite exciting to be able to do that kind of cultural history. But there's a kind of interesting story why you were able to say that it didn't happen until the 1840s, because it, before your book, it was a documented fact that the, it was in 1805, I think, that these two lectures uh, questioned Shakespeare's authorship. Yeah. And what did you discover? Well, one of the nightmares of my book was after four years of researching this, I was completely confident that until the 1840s and 1850s, the cultural fault lines hadn't shifted to a place where people can make the claim that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare. Unfortunately, there was in the University of London Library, at Senate House Library, two lectures written in 1805 that record an interview that took place in 1785 by a Oxford-trained uh, uh, historian, really, named James Woolman. And uh, he was the first to argue, these lecturers wrote, uh, claimed, that Shakespeare's works were written by Francis Bacon. And whether you get your facts from the, the Dictionary of National Biography or Wikipedia, that's the way it was. So I waited until the very end of my research, uh, hanging my head, went to the library, called up these lecturers, and a very stern librarian brought them to me. And about 20 minutes into it, I started laughing aloud because I realized these were forged. And the reason I knew they were forged was because the biography of Shakespeare you could pick up today will tell you, among other things, that Shakespeare made money, lent money, speculated in malt, and, and other kinds of activities, like a lot of people in Stratford at the time. But nobody knew that Shakespeare had speculated in malt until 50 years after this document was written. And nobody knew that he had lent money until years after this document was written. So it was pretty clear on that evidence. And I was able to bring in uh, the top paper guy, yeah. usually working with um, uh, forged checks or uh, bad currency in the UK. But uh, it was one of those once in a lifetime thrilling moments. And more than that, it protected my argument that nobody could have thought of this well, you know, in the 1850s. If you can't refute the evidence, discredit it. You know? Right. <laughs> That's a good, I'll remember well, that. So what, uh, when you look at the, the uh, people who have uh, championed the various uh, alternate authors, Francis Bacon, uh, the Earl of Oxford, my favorite one is Christopher Marlowe, who died you know, er, you know, uh, early in Shakespeare's career. Uh, well, what sort of people have been the champions of, of 
of, of these sort of alternate authors? D different types of personalities gravitate to different candidates. Um, Francis Bacon attracted some very, very serious thinkers in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, some of the most prominent were Mark Twain and um, Helen Keller was a surprise for me. I, I, you know, I, I know about the great life story of Helen Keller, but not until I went to the American Foundation for the Blind and called up the files that I realized there's a manuscript across from Madison Square Garden written, typed actually, by Helen Keller, who was a terrific touch typist, arguing that Francis Bacon wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. And uh, I was just shocked. And she couldn't get her publishers to touch it. She really wanted to publish this manuscript. And they said, Helen, just keep pumping out the memoirs. It's the brand. You're going to damage the brand. And um, it's terrific correspondence. She was so feisty. I had enormous respect for her. Yeah. Uh, her friend, Mark Twain, uh, was convinced that Shakespeare didn't write the plays. And for good reason, because Twain believed in his heart of hearts, if you didn't live it, you couldn't write it. So early on in his career, he wanted to do a, write a novel about somebody going off to South America for the diamond, uh, the great diamond rush there. He had family uh, issues he couldn't get over. He hired a journalist. Uh, who was a friend, to go over there, wrote up a long contract that's now in the New York Public Library saying, you're going to keep a diary, you're going to come straight back to my house, I'm going to lock you up, pump you dry until I can tell the story firsthand as if I had written it. And um, the guy did everything he was told. He was allowed to keep all the diamonds he got, over 5,000. Everything was worked out. And he stabbed himself with a fork eating on the, uh, on the boat home and died en route, unfortunately. And... Um, <laughs> Twain still owed a couple thousand dollars and had to write, uh, I think, Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer. I'm not really sure which one. So there are a lot of happy endings to this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there was, you know, the, there seems to be, you know, a, a, actually a lot of strange uh, endings in madness and poverty of these people. Uh, That's true. Uh, many of whom have published nothing in their, you know, in their careers except a single scholarly work, you know, on this. The, Having discredited these early lectures, you were able to actually make another rather interesting dis discovery, which was that the person who began the whole authorship question of, you know, that uh, Shakespeare was not written by Shakespeare, uh, instead by Francis Bacon, the first substantial one, was an American woman named Delia Bacon. Delia Bacon. Uh, no relation to Francis Bacon. Everybody uh, trashes her for that. Um, and when I began reading about her, uh, she was one of the most vilified uh, intellectuals in the 19th century, and even as great a scholar as Sam Schoenbaum, who wrote Shakespeare's Life, one of the lives, one of the great books about yeah. Shakespeare, calls her a deviant and, f and far worse. <laughs> uh, Delia Bacon was born in a log cabin in uh, 1811 in Ohio on the frontier and was uh, part of a family of uh, uh, very devout uh, uh, Americans and uh, her father died and uh, he was a Congregationalist. Her brother Leonard was one of the major Congregationalists in the um, mid-19th century in this country and uh, she became one of the first women in this country to lecture publicly in front of co-educational audiences. Extraordinary. And uh, she had a, a life crisis, both a spiritual crisis within her own church and a disastrous uh, uh, disappointment in love and decided to uh, devote her career to proving that Francis Bacon at the center of a cohort of, uh, of writers wrote the plays of Shakespeare. Yeah, her life alone is, uh, is one of the most interesting things in this. I mean, she was the darling of... of well, my favorite thing about it is that she, she won first place in a short story contest that Edgar Allan Poe lost. Yeah, she beat uh, Poe. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then Poe was so smitten by her, he gave her a great review. Yeah. You know? But Whitman loved her, Emerson loved her, the, but the British didn't much care for her. Uh, they laughed at her uh, a little bit. She was going around trying to pry open Shakespeare's grave. She was just, um, at that point, she lost her sanity after publishing her book in 1857. And people decided that she was insane before that. She wasn't. She was just committed. And she wanted to kind of place Shakespeare's works in, a, in an almost an American framework. 
she wanted to argue that the people at the center of whom were, was uh, Francis Bacon, this little cabal, uh, were really the patriots, the founding fathers of republicanism, radical people who, um, you know, the Puritans had claimed to really develop all these ideas, but she was arguing that the people who created Shakespeare's plays had really created the thought that went into the founding of America. And uh, she read these as radical left texts. And it's very interesting because when people say to you, oh, you know, what difference does it make who wrote the plays or which claimant matters, the people who argued for Bacon tended to be on the political left. The people who argued for the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, tend to be on the political right. Now, I say that with some caution because <laughs> Justices Scalia and Stevens both believe that the Earl of uh, Oxford wrote Shakespeare's plays, <laughs> and they do not inhabit the same political universe. But the founding movement uh, for the Earl of Oxford was a man named J.T. Loney, spelled and often mispronounced Looney, by Shakespeareans yeah. who don't want to take these thinkers seriously, who wanted to return to a kind of uh, anti-democratic, uh, if you will, right-wing feudal past where everybody knew his place and the Earl of Oxford was the ideal candidate for him. Because, yeah. I mean, at the center of these arguments was always that uh, these books had to be in some ways autobiographical, and that in all of the evidence for Shakespeare not writing Shakespeare, uh, since there is no documentary evidence, it all has to be internally produced. And the most interesting things were the people that believed that the plays were written in some kind of cryptographic system. And someone fell, you know, developed an early decoder, gigantic decoder ring, which yes, eventually a gigantic <laughs> decoder ring. You know, eventually drove him crazy. He, yeah, he um, he regretted it. A doctor from Detroit who was also dredging rivers by the end of his life, trying to find the the the, the code, told him to search in rivers. I don't know why anybody would bury literary texts in an iron case <clears throat> in a river, but that's what the code told him. There's another nice. Again, this is a story with happy endings. Uh, after you've read 500 code books about Shakespeare, because I think there are roughly that many, maybe there were 300, it felt like 500, um, you get to uh, a man named William Friedman, who was a medical student in, um, at Cornell and was brought to Illinois to help with the science of decoding with the Baconians. And he became one of the great cryptologists uh, in the 20th century and was brought in by the United States government to train and, and, and find other people who could break codes and was one of the group that broke the Japanese code that won the Battle of Midway. So when people say, what difference does this story make? It helped us win the big one. I mean, this, you know, it matters. And, and I think if he hadn't done that, um, uh, we wouldn't be here today. So, so there's, no Shakespeare, there's no Shakespearean code, but there was a Japanese code. Uh, there so was, was Code Purple. Yeah. There, there absolutely was. Well, you know, as, as you go through all of these interesting stories and sift through all this evidence, some larger ideas emerge. And one of the ones that I found most interesting was that why would people, after hundreds of years, suddenly start to question Shakespeare's authorship? And the, the idea that you bring forward very, very convincingly is that there had been a deification of Shakespeare. Shakespeare was a kind of literary cultural god. And at the same time that they were, in a sense, bringing a different kind of criticism to the Bible, uh, to religious myth, they brought the same impulse to Shakespeare. Yeah. It, the story of Shakespeare changed necessarily over time. When Shakespeare's contemporaries and many, many writers in his day, a score of them that I discuss in the book, you know, knew him, praised his work, uh, lumped him with other writers. Uh, ben Johnson would say how far you did outshine Marlowe and Kidd and, and Lily and the like, but he's always in a group. About a century after his death, he becomes one alone, you know, this, this great star. And by the time you get to the middle of the 18th century, and David Garrick's talking about him as the god of our idolatry. Um, they're selling Shakespeare relics. Garrick builds a temple to yeah. Shakespeare on his estate. And what happens is there are two stories happening at once. One is the deification of this literary divinity. And the other is the facts that are emerging about Shakespeare's life. The facts that are emerging are 
He made a good living. He invested in some pretty smart real estate. He lent money. He speculated in mall. And the more information that emerged about the life, because there were no diaries then to speak of. People didn't write personal essays. The kind of glimpse into Shakespeare's inner life that people really wanted was unavailable for him and for everybody else. But the gap between the mercantile Shakespeare, Shakespeare the businessman, and Shakespeare the literary god grew and grew. It grew so great that it began to crack. And two things helped push them even further apart. One in the late 18th century was the recognition that the other literary deity, Homer, turned out not, could not have been one person, but a kind of 300-year storytelling group that went under the name of Homer. And the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, The Life of Jesus uh, that was published in the 1830s that argued and showed that the events in the gospel were mythic rather than necessarily factual. So people began to say, first Homer, then Jesus, why not Shakespeare? And just about that time, Delia Bacon came along and said, we saw it with Homer, we saw it with Jesus, why not Shakespeare? And the playbook for the anti stratfordian and the whole anti stratfordian movement was written by a, a, a young Lutheran um, named uh, Schmucker, who was trying to come These back. These people all have unfortunate names. It's true, you know? it's true. <laughs> It's true. I can't lie and make this up, though. Uh, and uh, Schmucker was trying to defend Jesus against claims that, you know, it's mythic. Uh, and he said, well, why don't we just imagine that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare? And he gives all the arguments that have been used for the next 150 years, although he clearly believed that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. So the arguments really spin out of these other controversies. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know, I saw Shakespeare in love, and so you know, I know that basically Shakespeare had things happen every day, and he wrote about him in his plays. <laughs> and, uh, but you seem to doubt this. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, you think that we should bring a, a rather different sense of how an author created in, in the Renaissance. Yeah, well, I was hoping to ask you about that poem that you write about your daughter, because <laughs> is this kind of a secret daughter we haven't heard about, or is the work truly yeah. not autobiographical? Yeah. Yeah. We live in Oprah age. We live in an age of memoir. You know, 20 years ago, you'd go to a party, and you'd bump into somebody, and they'd say, oh, I'm writing a novel. Now they say, I'm, I'm writing a memoir. And we assume that all writing is necessarily autobiographical. The writing from the past, just like much writing today, is autobiographical. Elizabethans would have been amused by this. There was no Iowa school of Elizabethan writing where a schoolmaster <laughs> said, you know, Kid Marlowe, uh, Ben Johnson, Shakespeare, uh, what are you brought to us today? And Marlowe says, well, I'm, I'm working on the story about a Scythian shepherd named Tamburlaine who conquers the world. And his teacher saying, well, are you Scythian? Uh, have you been to Scythia? Uh, have you conquered? You know, just that's not the way it, it went down back then. But People want to argue, since there's no other evidence, you have to argue from the plays themselves. One, one of the things that I really do in my book is, um, my book is, is, is ostensibly about the anti-Stratfordians. It's really about my fellow Shakespeareans, and, and I include myself in, the, in, in that group, who do the same thing. In other words, read a play like Hamlet and say, he had to have written this, mourning the loss of his son or the loss of his father or reading a play like The Tempest and saying, this has to be autobiographical. He breaks his staff and goes into retirement and burns his book. The problem is, Shakespeare's age was not one that produced autobiographical drama. And there are 1,200 characters in Shakespeare. So you can, as with an a la carte menu, pick and choose which characteristics you want. So an Oxfordian will grab me by the lapels at a conference and say, look, Oxford had three daughters, which he did. Oxford was captured by pirates, which he was. Shakespeare only had two daughters and was never captured by pirates. <laughs> Who do you think wrote King Lear and Hamlet? <clears throat> and if you go down that road, you can't really win that argument. If you believe that the evidence for authorship are the autobiographical traces, then you're going to conclude that Shakespeare was a countess, or Shakespeare was a mariner, or Shakespeare was whoever you want Shakespeare to be. Because 
he created a lot of characters, and you can create any Shakespeare. Kind of like, I never thought of this, but remember when you were young, Mr. Potato Head, you got to put <laughs> little different things? That's a little bit of what the authorship controversy is about. Well, as you go through the whole authorship uh, controversy, you actually, though, bring us to uh, a, what the real authorship issues are about Shakespeare, which is pointing out that Elizabethan and Jacobean London was rather like you know Hollywood yeah. under Sam Goldwyn. Yeah, uh, no, it, it, it's which true. Which is that many people would work on a script. Would you want to talk about that? Sure. You know, authorship works in in, in complicated ways. Then you know, we we like to assume that works of literature are not only confessional, but works of singular genius working alone. Shakespeare had, uh, to me, a very interesting career. Early on, he was an actor and began writing plays in the late 1580s, early 1590s. In 1594, uh, he joined a company, was one of the founding members of the company, called the Chamberlain's Men and uh, it was probably the most uh, successful acting company of all time. And in 1599, Shakespeare became a shareholder in the theater where they played, and in 1608 was a shareholder in their other theater, an indoor theater, where they spent the winter months, Blackfriars. And he was a part of a group that spent every morning rehearsing a play, and in the afternoon after a meal would perform that play. And it was a different play every day. It wasn't cats now and forever. They had to, a rolling repertory. So it did be, and Shakespeare stopped acting but kept writing after 1604 or so. And one of the things that happened in his career early on, but especially after 1604, is he began collaborating with other writers. So Pericles, written sometime around 1605 or 1606 uh, uh, or 7, was written in collaboration with an aspiring writer and innkeeper named George Wilkins, real low-life, beat-up woman. I mean, we, we know a lot of things about him, none of them good. But Shakespeare wrote Pericles with him. Shakespeare seized upon a rising star named Middleton and wrote Timon of Athens with him around 1605 uh, or so before or right after King Lear. Shakespeare wrote three or four of his last plays with uh, a man named Fletcher. Uh, Henry VIII, Two Noble Kinsmen, a lost play called Cardinio, and we can see that this was really active collaboration. Those who believe that Christopher Marlowe, who died, as you noted, in 1593, could have written a play 20 years later, or even the Earl of Oxford, who died in 1604, could not have written collaboratively. Now, Shakespeare scholars and most everyone here in here probably took a Shakespeare class in college, they did not play up the collaboration. It's just not done. I think I've only started talking about Shakespeare as a collaborative writer. It's difficult. It's easier to say, you know, it was Shakespeare's sensibility. But the field is slowly moving to the point where they're saying Shakespeare was like virtually every other writer. Marlowe, Johnson, Decker, everybody wrote collaboratively at this time. The only period in which Shakespeare didn't write collaboratively was when he was acting and uh, and writing, it didn't really leave him time. Yeah. And, th and this is something that's not all that uncommon in performative arts, you know, where you bring the, you know, the company and, and all of the collective intelligence together. Two uh, you know, qu uh, quick questions, and then mm -hmm. we'll open it up to, to, to questions from the audience. Uh, the first is the question you ask yourself at the end of the book. What difference does it matter who wrote Shakespeare? Yeah, that was actually the question my editor asked me when I was negotiating the contract at the beginning. <laughs> and my favorite editor, uh, Julian Luce. Well, he said, give me a big advance and I'll tell uh, you. you know. uh. I should have thought of that, but I, he caught me off guard uh, at this terrible Italian restaurant where he insists on eating in London. And um, I, I just said it, it makes a big difference, and trust me. Uh, and he did. But I didn't have a good answer to that. Uh, and it took me four or five years to work up the answer, and, and it, it didn't come overnight. Uh, and the, the biggest answer, I mean, it, it obviously, I, I believe in truth rather than truthiness. So facts actually matter to me. And understanding how uh, people went about writing plays and created uh, uh, such extraordinary works of literature is important and I think worth understanding. And various conspiracy theories, because that's what they are, end up distorting 
the creative process, collaborative process, and other aspects of the Elizabethan moment. But what really, really mattered to me was so many of these writers who wanted to argue that the works are coded, that they are really um, barely um, translated aspects of his own experience. In other words, these plays are autobiographical or allegories of the political moment. If you go down that road, what you end up doing is denying the very thing that makes Shakespeare so extraordinary, which is his capacity to imagine. Now, either you think that he could not imagine a local habitation and a name, but had to actually identify and recycle bits and pieces of contemporary politics or his own travails, or you believe that he was somebody who read, thought, listened, and had a capacity to create worlds that, to my mind, at least in the, the English-speaking language, has been unmatched. It, w one final question. As a teacher, so, you know, confronting, you know, uh, to quote, you know, the bard, morning faces, yeah. uh, w what are your favorite plays to teach? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question, and it changes. Um, I do a lot of outreach with, with middle school kids in particular. Um, and with them, Romeo and Juliet is the great, the great play. Uh, I'm, I'm too old to experience it except through their eyes right now. I, I was teaching this morning, and uh, my new answer to your question, which I wouldn't have given last week, is The Winter's Tale. And I was with a group of about 60 sleepy kids who had written a paper on The Winter's Tale, so I knew I had read the play. And uh, they were just opening up this play for me in extraordinary ways. And I realized that not only is it a gift to be able to teach Shakespeare, but it's the gift that keeps on giving, that uh, I get smarter coming into contact, yes, with middle school kids, but with a bunch of bright Ivy League kids. Uh, it's extraordinary. And you're watching them wrestle. And there was one student who's on her way to Juilliard to become a professional uh, violinist. And she understood this, this question of creativity in such a brilliant way that I was just sitting taking notes. So uh, my heart is full of the winter's tale right now. So that's, that's my answer to that question. Good. Uh, well, uh, let's open up to the audience. Now, we have a microphone. So if you'd like to, uh, do we have, we have two, we have two microphones. OK. Uh, if, if you'd like to ask, ask a question, just raise your hand, and a microphone will be delivered to you as if by magic. Uh, <laughs> So just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Otherwise, I'll keep asking questions. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Ralph Remington. I'm director of theater at the National Endowment for the Arts uh, currently. And, um, and I, I just, um, the Christopher Marlowe theory, and I know it gets debunked a lot because he died in the period that he died. But there's also, I'm sure you're aware of the theory that he was spirited away to, I think, France and and then wrote from there collaboratively or by himself. Because I've heard the all of the above theory before that Shakespeare might have wrote with Bacon or, and others. So could that have possibly happened? or if, Sure. I'm happy to speak to that. You all heard that question. Um, my answer is a two-part answer uh, to that. Marlowe, by the way, those of you investing in Marlowe's stock as an anti-Stratfordian candidate, buy. Uh, and I, and I thank Dick Cheney for that. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Because rendition is exactly what the argument is for Marlowe. Snatched up, put on the equivalent of some CIA plane by the Elizabethan Secret Service, and dumped somewhere in Italy. I mean, that's the theory. I'm not making this up. I'll, I'll tell you why, besides the fact that there's a coroner's report that survives with 14 people who signed on to it saying Marlowe was dead, he had a stab wound, it went two inches above his eye, you know, all that. You'd have to believe in a tavern over the reckoning with some very seedy guys in, in, in Deptford. So that, that, that's fact. But if you want to believe that that's covered up a conspiracy, that's not what I'm going to argue. And in fact, if you go into Westminster Abbey right now, uh, you will see the Marlovians have been so aggressive that 
The dates of Marlowe's birth and death in the little window display for him say 1593, the year he was born, 1564, the year he was born, the 1593 question mark. <laughs> right? So this is where truthiness to me comes in. I'll tell you why Marlowe could not have written the plays, to, to my mind. And setting aside that I spent grad school writing a dissertation on Marlowe so that I can hear the verse rhythms of Marlowe yeah. so well. And I hear out of this year the verse rhythms of Shakespeare. That's not an argument that I could make in less than an hour or, or two hours, and we'd have to lock the doors. Here's my argument. When Shakespeare's writing Romeo and Juliet, long after Marlowe's dead, or in Italy, writing those plays and FedExing them to London, <laughs> he's writing the part of Peter, minor part, funny part, the nurse's buddy in, in Romeo. And when you go home and look at your editions of this play, it's just going to say Peter. But if you look at the first printed texts, which are based on Shakespeare's manuscripts, foul papers as we call them in the trade, you will see that Shakespeare doesn't write Peter. He writes instead for this speech heading, he writes Kemp. Who is Kemp? Will Kemp is the greatest clown, the greatest comedian in England, and he's a member and fellow shareholder with Shakespeare in that joint stock company called the Chamberlain's Men. Shakespeare's not thinking Peter. He's thinking, what am I writing for Kemp so that he doesn't bug me tomorrow and say I didn't give him good lines? When he's writing skinny man parts, he's writing not the name of the skinny characters in the Henry plays. He's writing Synclo, because there's a skinny guy in his company named Synclo. How Marlowe would know the change in composition of this company to be able to write the names of the fellow actors rather than the parts Beggars believe, unless somebody's FedExing, changing company rosters back to him in Italy. So, um, teleconferencing. I, well, that too. Um, look, a lot of this stuff boiled down to people seeking out professional seance experts to be able to communicate with the dead. I mean, people really want to believe. I, I, I'm never going to change the mind of a single person who deeply, deeply believes that Marlowe or Oxford or Bacon or Dana wrote the plays. Um, it's just not going to happen because that's a matter of belief. But I'm interested in explaining why they believe it and the consequences of that belief. Question in the back. Thank you. You led right into it. Why? I'd like to hear a little more of your thoughts about why people seem to have this need to believe something that is kind of tortuous. <sighs> Reason not the need, the basis, beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. Uh, Shakespeare answered that question a while back. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Um, I've spent at least two hours a day um, reading the anti stratfordian websites and chat rooms for the last five years. And God help me, I don't really understand that need. I refuse to say it's snobbery. I don't think it is. I think each individual who doesn't believe that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare has his or her own systems of belief and world vision that explains it. Otherwise, how could Scalia and Stevens both think that Oxford? Yeah. But, th but that's why it's wonderful that Sigmund Freud doubted the authorship. Yeah, Sigmund <laughs> Freud, you know, it was one of these say it ain't so shoeless Joe moments for me. <laughs> I, I love Freud, read a lot of them in college, and um, Freud was coming up with his great book, The Interpretation of Dreams, and the theory, the Oedipal theory, because all his patients were coming to him and saying, my father's making a pass at me. My uncle had sex with me. The seduction theory. And he either had to accept that what his patients were telling him was true and producing the great crises in their, in their mental lives, or that they were fantasizing. And Freud lost his father right around this time. And he was reading a great Shakespeare biography by a man named George Brandis. And Brandis argued Shakespeare wrote Hamlet right after the death of his father. And Freud, whose father just died, was going through this terrible what he described as an edible crisis, realized Shakespeare's Hamlet is going through this. And the reason that Shakespeare could write Hamlet was because Shakespeare was going through this crisis. So it's as if Hamlet is the dream matter, Shakespeare's on the couch, and Freud diagnoses both of them and comes up with this great Oedipal theory. Oedipus gives it the name. Hamlet gives it the drive. All well and good. 
he actually believed Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare until George Brandis wrote another book 15 years later saying, got the date of Shakespeare's father's death wrong, sorry. He wrote <laughs> Hamlet before his dad died. Freud said, okay, I have a choice. Either my theory stands on wobbly legs, although it has a lot to recommend it, or I'm going to find out whose father died and his mother was <laughs> married. And it turns out the Earl of Oxford did, and to his grave, he went. He was one of those guys. He, one of the great, great finds for me was in Wisconsin Historical Archive. Um, God bless the archivists there. Uh, there's a stash of materials, letters to a, a doctor from Poughkeepsie named, and I'm, I know it's another one of these names, Smiley Blanton. <laughs> so, Smi Smiley went to Austria to be psychoanalyzed by Freud. Four months into his analysis, and I don't know whether Freud said a word yet, um, he says to Smiley, do you think the man from Stratford wrote the plays? Smiley's completely caught off guard. He says, who are you talking about, Shakespeare? Yeah, he did write the plays. Freud says, you know, that's not the right answer. Read this book and come back. And Smiley went to, to the cafe across the street where his wife was waiting for him and said, you read this. Huh? You know, Freud's a crank. We're sailing home tomorrow. Um, anyway. For more about Smiley, you can read the book. But people <laughs> believe Freud, who's as smart as anybody. And like I said at the beginning, smart people think dumb things. There's a hand yeah. up in the front. Uh, I'm Peter Dixon. Um, I've been involved in the authorship question. Uh, I don't know if you know of me. Um, I did, uh, Washington Post had a big article about the Spanish marriage crisis mm -hmm. being the context for the first folio. I also published uh, an essay in Tennessee Law Review about the Catholic question and the implications of that very nasty issue in your camp for the authorship question, although most Oxfordians or others, they don't want to touch the Catholic question either. Anyway, three observations. Uh, they're challenging, I think. One, the reason for the skepticism is not because of some emotional instability, although it may have been in some cases. If you ask for a smoking gun document that links the Stratford man to literary and theatrical activity, you should have a lot. I mean, he was at a very high level, uh, what, professional dramatist at the court, essentially. You have the interlineation in the will with the memorial rings to the three actors. I don't know of anything else than that. And that's why people are bothered by the gaps. Second option. Can I, can I, why don't you just ask one question or make, make okay. one question because it'll be difficult to answer all of them. Well, that's just, that's just an observation. Okay, so ask a question. The other, well, uh, I would say if I had to ask one question, um, I wonder if you can tell us where he's buried because I'll, I'll say why I wonder. Okay, thank you. The grave is unmarked. There's no name on it. Francis Beaumont's buried in the Web Westminster Abbey in the Poets' Corner six weeks before. You can throw all the roses you want on that anonymous tomb. There's no name on it. But the bust on the wall, underneath it, it says, whose name doth deck this tomb, whom Andreas death hath placed within this monument. Schoenbaum struggled with this. You can settle it very easily if it's fraud. Scan the wall. I think it's solid. That's... That's deception. I don't think any, and I asked Michael Wood this question and I stunned him in the Smithsonian three years ago and he babbled on. He didn't have an answer for that. Okay, so <laughs> where, not, where is he buried? Uh, where's Shakespeare buried? <laughs> That's a good question. In 1616, Shakespeare died. We know that Shakespeare died in 1616, and I don't think anybody disputes that. There is a, uh, a monument uh, in the wall in the Stratford Church, and uh, many of you have visited it or seen reproductions. There's a beautiful one at the Folger, in which Shakespeare looks like a pork butcher rather than the writer yeah. we really want him. We, we want it to look like Keats or Shelley, but he looked like a middle-aged man with uh, uh, receding hair. Shakespeare's family and friends paid for that memorial. And presumably, although I haven't been underground to the crypt uh, and unearthed the bones, that's where Shakespeare most likely is buried. What's interesting to me and fascinating 
uh, and that's a lovely essay that you've written in the Tennessee Law Review, and I know you're very learned and erudite on the subject. The problem for me with the kind of questions that you're asking, uh, especially the first one, which is to say there ought to be a lot of evidence he was such a luminary figure. If you study and spend your life living in 1599, as I did for 15 years, one of the things you discover is there's a relatively limited amount of information about any individual lower than the king and queen or a handful of courtiers whose families maintained their papers. We know a remarkable amount about Shakespeare as a writer, and we know that from his fellow writers who speak about him. Now, I see you nodding your head. You know, all I can say is... You're the, assuming what you're trying to prove. That's the problem that our court is having. Well, I'm assuming that the records that say William Shakespeare and the people who wrote with him and the people who knew him in Stratford, in London, or the people like Leonard Diggs, who connected the Shakespeare writer with the man buried at Stratford, were speaking from experience. If you want to believe, and I, I'm not here to change your mind, I'm only trying to say that any argument, <clears throat> any argument that claims that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare but was somebody else depends on a conspiracy theory because there is not any evidence. Sometimes two conspiracy theories. A conspiracy to mask the identity of the true writer and a conspiracy by people who teach at schools like mine to mask this truth as well. I'm not interested in arguing conspiracies. I'm interested in talking about why they emerged and when they emerged. God help me, I will never change your mind, and that's not the intent of the book. The intent of the book is really, now, you've asked your question, now it's my turn again. The intent of the book is, is this. There's going to be a movie coming out next year, and it's by Roland Emmerich, who's one of the great disaster movie makers of our time. And I don't know if this is a crowd that has seen 10,000 BC or 2012 or the other great disaster movies he's made. He's filming this in Germany right now. And it's a book that argue, a movie rather, that's going to be starring Vanessa Redgrave as Queen Elizabeth. It's going to have an extraordinary cast, including anti Stratfordians like Mark Rylance and Sir Derek Jacobi. And it's going to argue a theory that came out in the uh, 1940s that Queen Elizabeth was not a virgin queen, that she gave birth to a son, the Earl of Oxford, that when he came of age, she had sex with her son, and they produced the Earl of Southampton, and in this tangled web, the explanation for why the plays attributed to Shakespeare are truly written by the Earl of Oxford. Now, I'm imagining school teachers across this land, <laughs> the day after that movie opens, having Johnny come in and raise his hand and say, why are you party to suppressing the truth of Elizabeth's incestuous sex life and the true authorship? And the reason I wrote this book, although I didn't know about this movie, was so that teacher will have an answer to that question. Okay. And that's it. Another question over here? On the Sorry. left. Any which way. You addressed this uh, a little bit in, uh, earlier, but just as it's possible to look at a sunset without worrying about the, uh, how, was cre how creation was started, can I just enjoy these plays without <laughs> worrying about these questions and just enjoy the brilliance and the drama of it? I think you can. I think you should. My experience of Shakespeare emerges as we were talking about this earlier. Now, I never took a, a college course on Shakespeare. I learned about Shakespeare from watching great plays. And there's a, a student in the audience who's just read The Merchant of Venice and other plays. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. The problem is the politics that's pulled in with claiming somebody else wrote the plays. Whether it's left-wing politics, whether it's right-wing politics, whether it's only a nobleman could have written this. And that is, I think, something that should give us pause. If you can block your ears to those arguments and just listen to the play as staged, that's terrific. Unfortunately, now there are being produced Oxfordian editions of all the plays to try to convey to students that these are autobiographical documents and how to read them in that way. So it's actually nearly impossible to do what you're trying to say, which is 
enjoy the plays in a vacuum. It, I would love for it to be the case. If that were so, I wouldn't have wasted five years. You, know, you only get a number of books in a scholarly career. And after 60 or so, the books probably trail off in quality. So for me to devote five years of my life, instead of writing uh, what I really wanted to do, which was to write a book about the year in which Shakespeare wrote King Lear and Macbeth, meant sacrificing some of that uh, capital. And I'm glad I'd done it, but uh, it wasn't a lot of fun to do. And uh, I did it because what your argument can't, can't really be done. Okay, let's take one more question. I think we had somebody here that... Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask you, that's a good segue. W tell me about the process of writing this book. You talked about the 300 yeah. to 500 decoding books. Talk about the source sure. research you did. You know, this is a taboo area in Shakespeare's studies. Uh, you don't get tenure. You don't get hired writing a book about the authorship controversy. And uh, people step away from you. People came up to me when I told them I was writing about this and said, are you going over to the dark side? And uh, I was troubled by the the tone that Shakespeareans use when describing Delia Bacon or uh, J.T. Loney, I thought they were disrespectful. I didn't think they took these works seriously. I think that they were too quick and easy to brush this off. This was snow without tracks in it. You know, and I found material because scholars ignored this material. And uh, the process was quite exhilarating because Fewer areas are more picked over than Shakespeare in Shakespeare studies. There are just too many of us turning over rocks. But uh, so the experience of researching this book meant um, following anti Stratfordian arguments, reading the elegant arguments that they've written in various uh, publications, and reading tons and tons of stuff that made my mind go soft. But always with respect for the motives that generated that book. I might have disagreed with the conclusions, but. Uh, I think you have to cede to every person you're arguing with good motives. You don't have to cede their conclusions. All opinions are not equally valid, but each search is equally valid. Professor Shapiro, thank you thank so much you. for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, outside, there's those doors, there's a lot of food and drink, and there's also copies of Contested Will, which Professor Shapiro will be happy to sign. Thank you so much.